Hello, everyone. Yeah, uh, welcome to the next talk in our SIG Mobile Community Engagement Program Invited Talk Series. Uh, so we have uh, Professor Col uh, Colleen Josephson today. Uh, Colleen is an incoming assistant professor at UC Santa Cruz and a research scientist at VMware. Her research interests include wireless communication and sensing systems with a focus on technologies to enable and improve sustainable practices. She is also co-chair of the Green G Working Group within the ATIS Next G Alliance, which aims to position North America as the global leader in sustainable next generation mobile networks. Colleen completed her PhD in electrical engineering in 2021 at Stanford University, where she was advised by Sachin Kati and Keith Winston. Before beginning her PhD, she worked at Cisco Meraki as a wireless engineer. And even before that, she received her SB and ME um, engineering degrees from MIT. She's also a former Microsoft research intern, a 2020 rising star in EECS, a finalist in the, in the 2019 MIT Bay Area Research Slam, and a re recipient of the Stanford graduate uh, Schlumberger Innovation and D. Shaw Exploration Fellowships. Um, so with that, I would uh, like to invite Colleen uh, to take the floor. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Colleen. Thanks, Malash. So good morning, everyone. It's uh, good to have you here. And thank you again for inviting me. So I'm excited to share my work on building sustainable sensor networks. Um, so my research focuses on building scalable sensing systems for sustainability. So systems that help us conserve uh, limited resources like water, power, nutrients. And uh, my work so far has included things like designing novel sensors and uh, sensing paradigms for agriculture, inventing techniques for ultra low power communication and in indoor sensor networks, and uh, more recently, exploiting non-traditional resources of energy, such as microbes. So I try to create systems that leverage advances in everyday technology, like automobiles, and smartphones that have made sophisticated devices uh, or formerly sophisticated devices like radars and ultra wideband radios more readily available to consumers. Now, the core question driving my work is how can we build practical efficient sensor systems to solve real world problems in potentially challenging environments? And what I mean by practical is that these systems need to be accurate because our decisions are only as good as our data, and they also, they also should be affordable and accessible, uh, as well as usable and maintainable, because after all, what good is your sensing system if it's very accurate, but the power budget doesn't last through a day? And to top it all off, how can we do this wirelessly? First, I wanna talk a little bit about why these environments are challenging for wireless sensing. So home and office environments have interference and noise. They're full of stuff and people that cause multipaths, which is where the signal bounces off the environment, causing multiple streams to arrive at the receiver and interfere with each other. Furthermore, other devices uh, and objects in the environment like microwaves or fluorescent lights uh, are often additional sources of interference and noise. Then we have agriculture, and a farm field is a rugged and remote environment. For the, for the most part, the, these places have no dedicated power or communication infrastructure. So anything you install is going to be exposed to the elements and difficult to power. Uh, in fact, entire new fields of research, such as intermittent computing, have been dedicated to solving the problems caused by unreliable power and communication. And finally, uh, personal sensing outside the home requires portability and user friendliness while operating on the limited compute and power budgets available to mobile devices. Now, wireless sensing can be split into two broad categories. In one, RF is used for communication. So here, a communication module like Wi-Fi or Bluetooth is paired with a special purpose sensor chip. So for example, wireless security cameras are paired with, an, uh, they pair an eight or two 11 radio with an image sensor. In the other category, um, GPS itself is used, sorry, in the other category, wireless, the wireless signal itself is used for sensing and uh, GPS receivers are an example of that. So they calculate your position using the phase of signals received from satellites. 
Now, both uh, RF for communication and RF for sensing, both of those are approaches are valid and useful. And uh, many systems, in fact, use a combination to achieve their goal. So fitness bands, for example, might use a combination of GPS data and local sensor data, like IMU units, to determine your exercise activity. My work draws from both approaches. So in the first half of this talk, uh, I'll be speaking about some wireless computer vision with commodity radios, which is a project we did, uh, and it's designed for use in the home or the office. And this work uses RF for communication by pairing a low power digital image sensor with a Wi-Fi backscatter communication module. In this, the communication link is used to offload high intensity computer vision work to the edge or the cloud. Next, I'll be talking about agricultural sensing with RF backscatter tags. This sensing system is designed for use in active farm fields, and it uses the RF channel to sense soil moisture with high accuracy. And I'll wrap up by talking about some of our latest work in harvesting power from microbes. But before diving into how to do sensing with backscatter, let's talk a little bit about what backscatter is. Now, all matter reflects some portion of incident RF, and this backscattering phenomenon is the principle behind radars and lidars. It can also be used to implement communication, though. Antennas can very effectively re-radiate incident RF, and by changing the impedance of the antenna, you can change the nature of the reflected RF. This allows us to implement communications using backscatter. So some of the simplest systems use uh, on-off keying, which is accomplished by grounding and ungrounding the antenna. And this toggles between maximal and minimal reflection modes, so one and zero. Modern backscatter communication systems have three main components. You have a transmitter that sends the incident RF, which is known as an excitation signal. Then the backscatter tag itself, which reflects the incident RF and modulates data on top of it. Finally, a receiver that receives the backscattered signal and it, it decodes the tag data. Some systems uh, combine the transmitter and receiver into one device, as is the case of RFID. Um, in fact, RFID is probably the most well-known example of backscatter communication. Oh, there we go. There's an illustration of the uh, three parts of the backscatter system. So RFID backscatter technology has been in commercial production since the 1970s, but the past 20 years have seen a huge surge in research on backscatter communication. In the late 90s, the first consumer laptop with built-in wireless was introduced, which was catalyzed our quest for low power wireless communications. And since then, we've also seen the rise of smartphones and Internet of Things devices, both of which demand communication at lower and lower power. So speaking of IoT, in an embedded system with traditional Wi-Fi, most of your power is going to be going towards the radio when it's transmitting. Backscatter, therefore, is an attractive option for low power communication because as a passive technique, it, considered, uh, it consumes orders of magnitude less power than active radios. Now, one area of particular interest has been backscatter communication that reuses already ubiquitous technologies. Projects like ambient backscatter from the University of Washington reuse signals that are already present in the air, like TV or radio transmissions. The backscatter tag can piggyback off of these ambient transmissions to create a mesh-like network. However, they can't connect to the internet. Other projects, like Wi-Fi Backscatter and Hitchhike take this idea further and reuse existing 802.11 Wi-Fi transmissions as excitation signals. And this is attractive because Wi-Fi is ubiquitous in offices and homes. Um, these were a great step forward, but unfortunately, these early projects rely on older 802.11b Wi-Fi specifications, which are no longer in common use. Our 2017 Freerider work made progress on that issue by being able to use modern 802.11 GNN OFDM Wi-Fi signals, as well as other ISM band signals like ZigBee and Bluetooth. So this means that these backscatter tags, now they can take advantage of ambient Wi-Fi signals that are in use. And furthermore, the backscatter communication can reach the internet. It was also the first work in this area to demonstrate simultaneous operation of multiple tags. 
So the key to using Wi-Fi radios as a backscatter transceiver is that the backscatter signal needs to be valid 802.11 Wi-Fi. And this is challenging because passive radios, by definition, cannot demodulate the incoming packets. So how can the tag remodulate the packet without corrupting it if it can't demodulate it? The key is our technique called code word translation. Code words are signal symbols in the physical layer used to represent data. So for example, in binary phase key shifting or BPSK modulation, that code book has only two code words, zero and one, um, you know, regardless of what you're communicating with, Wi-Fi, Zigbee, Bluetooth, all communication, whether it be wired or wireless, shares this concept of code words. So the tag needs to make sure that it doesn't destroy any code word presence in the excitation signal, or else the receiver might consider the packet corrupt and discard it. So therefore the tags do code word translation by ensuring that any changes they make to the phase, amplitude, or frequency of a code word are going to result in another valid code word. So in other words, by making sure that you have a discrete finite set of phase, amplitude, and frequency changes that the tag can perform, and that all of those changes result in another valid code word, you can make a backscatter uh, tag that can receives valid Wi-Fi, and then the reflected signal is also outputting valid Wi-Fi. So once the tag reflects this valid Wi-Fi, um, then the receiver receives it. And once the backscatter packet is successfully received, the Wi-Fi access point then must XOR the backscatter packet with the original excitation packet to recover the backscatter data. So perhaps the receiver, um, you know, maybe there's uh, two receivers and one received the excitation packet on one channel and the other receiver received the backscatter packet on a different channel. Uh, maybe the uh, excitation packet was communicated via wireline. So there's two access points, uh, one here that transmits, one here that receives on the backscatter channel. But anyway, you, at the receiver, you have the excitation packet and the backscatter packet, and then you XOR it. So this was the technology that we developed in Freerider, and it gives us a strong starting point to create a fully functional sensing system that integrates RF backscatter into modern Wi-Fi networks. So we decided to use this platform to explore sensing, uh, particularly for computer vision tasks, which means using a camera as a sensor. And uh, computer vision in embedded devices is challenging because of the computation, storage, and communication limits that are inherent to embedded devices. So this creates a resource allocation challenge. So again, we can uh, partition the approaches to this into two main categories, cloud offloading and onboard processing. So cloud offloading involves uploading images from the camera to an edge or cloud device. And the advantages here are that this saves compute power and storage space on the embedded device. And the images furthermore can be processed with established ML frameworks on a powerful GPU. The disadvantage is that this can lead to increased latency and the compute power savings on the embedded device need to be balanced with the increased communication so, uh, cost. So recall that Wi-Fi uses more power than the rest of the embedded system. Onboard processing, on the other hand, uh, processes images locally on the embedded device. This approach is low latency and doesn't require internet connectivity. However, onboard processing can have decreased accuracy compared to cloud approaches. And these algorithms and frameworks that you're running on the embedded device often need to be specially developed or adapted to the compute constraints of embedded devices. So again, um, both of these approaches are valid and useful and researchers are actively developing hybrid approaches. However, consider, what if we replace the traditional radio with a backscatter radio? Suddenly, communication becomes relatively cheap from a power standpoint. This is one of our motivations behind BackCam, which is our application agnostic camera platform that uses backscatter communication to enable low power computer vision. The system is split into two main parts. We have the back end, which lives in the edge or the cloud, and the camera board hardware. 
One of our key design insights was that because Wi-Fi backscatter is compatible with commodity radios, it's simple, relatively speaking, to create a feedback loop between the cloud and the embedded hardware. So this allows us to do flexible resource allocation so that we can optimize for power savings while still delivering the desired quality of service. Having a feedback loop between the embedded device and the edge infrastructure is important because the environment is constantly changing. So operating with fixed settings is inevitably going to lead to a subpar experience. So for example, um, you know, it makes sense that we can achieve longer battery life by operating in low resolution mode, but low resolution mode can negatively impact the accuracy of tasks such as face recognition. The low cost of backscatter communication means that our system can make context specific decisions by having the back end do resource intensive image processing. And then based off of what those images contain, dynamically reconfigure the camera. So for example, we made an application that defaults to the camera's low resolution mode. And then when the back end detects a face, it reconfigures the camera to increase the resolution until the face goes away, which means that this increased resolution leads to higher accuracy face recognition. And then you can go back down to the lower power, lower resolution mode when nobody's present. This adaptability improves face recognition success rates by nearly 50% compared to always operating in the low resolution mode. And uh, just a bit on the hardware for our system. Uh, we called it the unified camera board and it has two sub boards, a uh, radio board and a sensor board. And uh, the radio board uses an FPGA to implement the backscatter communication. And the sensor board has a microcontroller that uh, configures the camera and performs compression. Um, our camera is a low power image sensor that comes in black and white and color variants. And uh, it's actually become relatively popular. Uh, and our firmware is actually the first open source driver for this camera sensor. And I'll have a GitHub link up for that later. So altogether, this system consumes 9.7 milliwatts, which translates to nearly a month of continuous image streaming. For comparison, off the shelf wireless security cameras last less than two days running continuously. And I mentioned compression earlier. And one of the things that we discovered while exploring use cases is that compression is key to making the system more usable. However, compression is fairly challenging on resource constrained systems. So traditional compression requires storing both a key frame and the current frame in microcontroller memory and making a comparison for every pixel. This is too resource intensive for low power microcontrollers and many platforms don't have sufficient FRAM to store the entire two frames in memory. And doing uh, that many um, comparisons could drain the battery. So instead we designed a streaming compression algorithm that's optimized for low power backscatter systems. The full details of the algorithm are outlined in our 2019 IPSN paper. Um, and you know, all said and done, the approach, this compression is effective against latency more than having it. Without compression, it takes about five seconds to authenticate. With compression, it's only about 2.3, which makes the system more usable. Furthermore, if we turn on compression only when a face is detected, this improves battery life by 60%. So this interaction between compression and turning things on when they're needed, it allows you to have both the performance and the battery savings that you wanna be seeing. So the code and hardware design of this system is fully open source and available on GitHub. And uh, we actually taught an undergraduate lab class at Stanford based off of this platform um, where people made, the students made a wildlife camera and activity tracking, just to name some of the projects. And I also want to um, acknowledge the paper's second author, Lei Yang. Uh, he was a very talented undergrad um, at the time, an intern, and now he's doing his PhD with Muhammad at MIT. Uh, towards the end of the Backcam project, I spent some time at Microsoft Research. And at Microsoft, I learned how to use RF sensing to replace or augment traditional sensors. This was the beginning of my work of agricultural sensing with backscatter tags. I focused on soil moisture sensing first. As you all probably know, California and other parts of the Western US have been going through a drought for many years. 
It might surprise you to hear, however, that most of the fresh water in the entire world goes not towards household consumption, like showering or appliances, but instead to agriculture. Agriculture accounts for 70% of our fresh water consumption globally. At the same time, the UN predicts that more than half of the world population could be facing water shortages by 2050. Now this is a strategic water break time. The good news is agricultural water consumption doesn't need to be as high as it is. Decades of studies have shown that using soil moisture sensors can reduce water consumption by 20 to 50% while maintaining or even improving crop yields. But despite these uh, facts, fewer than 10% of US farms use sensors. To explain this, let's examine what a typical agricultural sensor network looks like. Right now, it's a distributed model that involves varying sophisticated and expensive sensors, and then communicating the data upstream to a centralized location, like a farmhouse. The power harvesting and communication modules, they add up in cost, and the wires and posts interfere with farming equipment. So many farms, in fact, need to completely remove and reinstall their entire sensing system every year. This is not the only way, though. In contrast, the remote sensing community uses a centralized model that involves measuring surface reflections with a mobile radar that's attached to a satellite, plane, drone, or vehicle. So this is completely wireless. So you don't have this issue where you have to uninstall and reinstall the system every year. Now, the disadvantage is that remote approaches compared to traditional sensor networks is that you're gonna see decreased accuracy and potentially decreased measurement depths and measurement resolutions, especially for satellites. So taking inspiration from both communities, I propose a hybrid model that gives us a completely wireless system without necessarily having to sacrifice accuracy or depth. It involves pairing inexpensive backscatter tags with a centralized reader that acts as a mobile edge device. The key to this system is that RF travels more slowly through wet soil than dry soil. So by measuring how long it takes the radar signal to reflect from the tag, we can measure soil moisture. Now, recall that dielectric permittivity is the ability of a substance to hold charge. The more charge that can be held, the higher the permittivity. So for reference, the permittivity of a vacuum is one and the permittivity of water is about 80. There's a strong correlation between dielectric permittivity and soil moisture. To measure the permittivity, we use this fact that the slower an RF wave travels through a medium, the higher the permittivity of that medium is. So in other words, the more wet the soil is, the slower RF travels through it. Therefore, if we can accurately measure the speed of RF waves going through soil, we can infer the soil moisture. Time of flight, often abbreviated as TOF, is the time that it takes an RF wave to propagate from A to B. High fidelity, measure, high fidelity TOF measurements let us estimate soil moisture. One way to measure time of flight is by transmitting pulses and timing how long it takes. To measure soil moisture accurately, we want a time of, resolution, time of flight resolution of at least a nanosecond. Unfortunately, standard Wi-Fi channels have a time resolution of multiple nanoseconds. There have been projects like Kronos that hop across multiple Wi-Fi channels to simulate a large effective bandwidth, which helps mitigate the effect of multipath and improve, improves time of flight measurements. <clears throat> a 2019 Mobicom paper uses this technique to measure soil moisture using active Wi-Fi radios. The primary drawback with using active radios underground though, is powering them. Wi-Fi backscatter could potentially solve this problem, but using Wi-Fi backscatter underground is very challenging. Soil attenuates RF far more than air, and even more so when the soil's wet. This impacts the performance of the detection circuit on the backscatter tag. When the detection circuit makes errors, it causes battery drain or backscatter packet corruption. And these are just some of the many challenges now, fortunately, a different technology called ultra wideband radios are becoming common. These inherently have a bandwidth of multiple gigahertz, so they're a great option for high accuracy time of flight measurements. 
Recent advances have made it so that anyone can relatively easily buy a cheap commodity ultra wideband radar development kit and use it to measure time of flight with high resolution. Wide bandwidth radars are even st starting to become incorporated into everyday consumer devices like smartphones. So for these reasons, I decided to create an ultra wideband radar based backscatter system for sensing soil moisture. I called the system WADAR. Pulling everything together, if we know the depth that a tag is buried at, the radar can measure the time of flight that it takes to reach the tag. The radar then also measures the time of flight that it takes to reach the ground surface. Using some algebra, we now know how long the wave takes to propagate D sub S in the soil. Now, recall that the travel time of RF in soil gives us permittivity. This, in turn, allows us to use standard models for soil moisture from literature in the soil science community. Now, the prototype tag itself consists of just an ultra wideband antenna, an RF switch, and an oscillator, all encased in a waterproof box. At the moment, it has a lifespan of five years on a coin cell battery uh, without duty cycling. So because of the simplicity, these tags would be relatively inexpensive to mass produce. Uh, we estimate as of a year or so ago on the order of three to five dollars a piece. Uh, the biggest cost is actually the weatherproofing. Uh, compared to a typical commercial soil sensor, uh, what the one we had was like $250. This is nearly two orders of magnitude in savings. So at this point, some of you might be wondering, if you have a radar, what, why do you even need a backscatter tag? Couldn't you just you know, put a plain piece of metal in the ground and call it a day? Uh, and unfortunately, the answer is no, not easily. The challenge comes with clutter. Clutter is caused by reflections coming from objects in the environment that are not the target tag. The tag is buried underground, which means it's surrounded by particles that cause clutter, like rocks, dirt, water, this makes it difficult to detect the signal from the tag. Fortunately, we can leverage modulation techniques to combat this clutter. So modulating, here we compare a modulating versus a non-modulating reflector. And we see that a modulating reflector allows us to sense the tag much more easily than a static reflector. The signal to clutter ratio of the modulating tag is orders of magnitude higher than a static tag. So how does this modulation work? Well, recall that a backscatter tag can toggle between maximal and minimal reflection modes by grounding and ungrounding the antenna. Here on the left, we have a plot of two superimposed radar frames, one from each of the tag's reflection modes. On the right, I've subtracted the minimal reflection frame from the maximal reflection. By comparing this difference between the radar frames obtained in these two modes, we now can clearly see that the tag is in bin 230. So the next question is, how do we know which frames correspond to maximal and minimal reflection mode or vice versa? Do we need to synchronize? Well, fortunately, if the radar is capturing frames at a regular rate and if the tag is toggling at a fixed frequency, we can avoid synchronization with some simple signal processing techniques. Let's take a moment to break that down. Radars divide their field of view into range bins and those bins have a width corresponding to the time of flight resolution that the device is capable of measuring. The higher the resolution, the smaller the width of the bin. For a radar with one transmit and one receive antenna, a frame is a vector of n complex values. The radar captures frames at a regular rate. This is akin to the sampling frequency. If the radar captures a total of P frames, then we end up with a complex N by P capture matrix. If we then apply a Fourier transform to each row of the capture matrix, the output is another N by P matrix whose rows are basically the power spectral density or frequency power for each range bin. Then if we plot these rows, we'll see an obvious high magnitude peak corresponding to the location and frequency coordinates of the tag. Representing this visually, we get a range Doppler plot like the one here. Since the tag is oscillating at a constant rate, we see a bright peak corresponding to the tag fundamental of 80 Hertz. Now, if we go back down a dimension, let's isolate the column that corresponds to this 80 Hertz frequency bin. This column tells us how far away everything is that's oscillating at 80 Hertz. 
There's one big peak at bin 300, so we can conclude that the tag is there. So to recap, the first step of sensing soil moisture with backscatter is installing the tag at a known depth D. Then you use a radar to capture frames. You take the Fourier transform of those captured frames and use that to identify the peak. And from there, that tells you the time of flight tau. Once you have the time of flight tau, you can use that to calculate the permittivity. And finally, from this permittivity, you can use calibrated polynomials from the soil science community to estimate theta, soil moisture, from the permittivity. So now that you know how the system works, how deep does it sense? This is where a link budget comes in. To summarize all the gains and losses in a system, the link budget is used to estimate the expected performance for different scenarios. To estimate how far underground water can measure soil moisture, we need to construct one of these budgets. Most link budgets are based on the Friis transmission equation, which says that the received power is determined by multiplying the transmit power by the system's gains and losses. In a radar system, the waves travel to the target and back. So for a far field target, um, yeah, there we go. For a far field target, the free space path loss is squared. Another important parameter specific to radar systems is something called the radar cross section, which is a measure of how well the target scatters incident RF. Now, we can't forget that the backscatter tag is underground. And this introduces two additional loss terms, L sub P and L sub R, caused by the soil. L sub R reflection loss depends on the relative permittivity of the soil, which is largely influenced by the soil moisture. So the more wet the soil is, the more reflection loss there is. Propagation loss, on the other hand, depends on both the permittivity and the tag's distance underground, D sub S. So what do the impacts of these losses look like? On the left, we have the predicted received power for a tag that stays stationary, but the radar changes height. The tag is one foot underground and the radar ranges from one to 10 meters above the ground. We see that as we expect, uh, soil near saturation is going to attenuate the signal significantly more than dry soil. So this means that a drone hovering 10 meters above the ground might not be able to detect the tag if the soil is near saturation. The good news is, is this doesn't frequently happen in agricultural settings. You don't want to waterlog your fields. The target soil moisture is usually somewhere between 20 and 30%. So then what about the converse, where the radar height is fixed, but the tag depth varies? In this case, we see that the impact of tag depth is much more significant than the radar height, linear versus logarithmic, which makes sense because the path lost through dirt is more significant than through air. So in summary, how deep you can go is going to depend on how high you want to read from. So if your reader is human height, one to two meters above the ground, for the soil moisture levels that we typically see in, agri so typically see in agriculture, we, we expect the sensor to be deployable to at least a meter underground, which is going to be sufficient for the vast majority of crops. Uh, I have a demo video here, but I think I'm going to uh, skip it for the sake of time. And so let's look at how well the system actually can measure soil moisture. Different types of dirt have different properties. So to do evaluations for work like this, you wanna collect multiple types of dirt. For my lab evaluations, I collected three types of dirt that are considered suitable for farming. That was uh, really quite the experience. Uh, it involved buying a shovel and some buckets and renting a truck to drive to open spaces in the California Bay Area. And uh, so we did our evaluations at one foot. To prevent the backscatter signal from leaking out the sides, you want to cover the tag on all sides by a foot. And that translates to nearly about a cubic meter of each type of dirt, which um, I actually collected by myself on a 90 degree day. And I don't know if any of you garden, but it turns out that real dirt from the ground is significantly more dense than the potting soil that you get from the hardware store. So altogether, I actually, um, by myself, ended up transporting more than 500 pounds of dirt that day. So uh, clearly, I was very dedicated to this work. <laughs> um, anyway, all said and done, 
the radar-based approach achieves an average error of 1.4%. For comparison, uh, the $250 commercial sensor we compared against had an error of 1.3%. And this error number is typical. Most commercial sensors claim an error between one and 3%. The takeaway here is that WADAR, our radar backscatter based system, is getting a very similar, similar accuracy to state of the art commercial sensors, but at a, a cost of just a few dollars per measurement point. Now, these uh, lab results are promising, but of course we have to think about how well the system works in the real world. So I did some in situ experiments in the ground at the Stanford farm. So I dug a hole and I put a tag inside and then every hour for five hours, I poured a couple of gallons of water on the tag site. I took measurements uh, half an hour and one hour after every irrigation. And the reason for that delay is to give the water a chance to seep and reach the commercial sensor. In these experiments, the two competing systems disagreed by less than 2%, which means that our system can deliver in the real world, not just the lab. So I think these results support the hypothesis that RF backscatter can be used to measure soil moisture with high accuracy. So uh, in the final portion of this talk, I wanna take a few minutes to talk about some ongoing and future work. So I see this uh, soil moisture sensing endeavor as not just a standalone paper or two, but as part of a rich ecosystem of work that aims to transition us away from traditional sensing models and towards making agricultural sensing more accessible and ubiquitous, uh, hopefully improving food and environmental security for our future. One really interesting topic I've started exploring in the past year is microbial fuel cells. One of the problems with underground backscatter tags is that beyond 10 to 15 centimeters, the RF is attenuated far too much for the tag to do effective power harvesting. This means that underground tags usually need a different source of power if they're gonna be deployed at deeper depths. The WADAR prototype tag has a projected battery life of five years when we're using a coin cell, but ideally we'd want a renewable source of power so you could put it in the ground and leave it. This is where something called a microbial fuel cell comes in. Microbial fuel cells, which are also sometimes called mud batteries, harvest power from microbes that naturally occur in the soil. MFCs are uh, fairly well known in the civil engineering and biology communities, but they're a new topic for the EE and sensing communities. As such, there's very little work researching the feasibility of using these as a power source in outdoor sensor networks. So how these MFCs work is that these bacteria naturally occurring in the soil, uh, some of them are a type of bacteria called exoelectrogenic bacteria. And what that means is they produce electrons as a byproduct of their naturally uh, occurring respiration process. And the exo part means that this external electron, these bacteria are uh, really happy to find somewhere to donate that electron. So if you put an electron acceptor in the soil, and then you have another electrode on the top of the soil and you put a load between them, uh, you now have formed a battery. And because this acceptor is conducive to the um, microbes environment, they, they colonize the surface of the anode and they basically form a biofilm. So, um, you know, as I said, you know, this is relatively new um, territory for electrical engineering communities. Uh, so we were, did some of the first experiments where we took these microbial fuel cells and we put them outdoors in a real environment to observe kind of what happens in an actual farm setting versus a laboratory. And our early experiments suggest that these cells could potentially produce enough power to sustain a low power microcontroller using backscatter to, to communicate. Um, my collaborators and myself, we've created more than 16 prototype fuel cells. Uh, here's an image of some of our earliest prototypes. And as I mentioned, we deployed a few of them outdoors for a multi-month observational experiment. So here's some early data from one of our deployment sites. Um, these were deployed originally in July, so I'm taking a zoomed in excerpt. Uh, this is just a little bit of many months of stable behavior. It's still on the ground right now. It demonstrates that it's possible for a single microbial fuel cell to consistently generate half to one and a half microwatts of power. And while that's not much, 
that's enough power to support backscatter communication or potentially keeping a microcontroller in deep sleep state. And other interesting things that you can observe is that the microbes react to conditions like water content, nutrient levels, and temperature. So these factors all increase or decrease the power that the, the fuel cell produces. So there's a lot of interesting problems to investigate here. So can we design the cells to be better optimized for soil that isn't mud and therefore increase the power output? Can we chain multiple cells together to increase the power output? How well do the tags recover from being frozen? Some of our collaborators are in Chicago and they're, they're getting, getting some of the first data from that experiment uh, kind of as things begin to thaw. And can we leverage predictable behaviors like these dineural fluctuations to more efficiently harvest and use the power? So here's an example of what it looks like to harvest energy from these cells right now. At the moment, we're using an off-the-shelf harvesting chip, but that's not ideal. These chips are mostly designed for solar and other more common energy sources, and that doesn't translate optimally to MFCs. Microbes react unpredictably, at least to us, to the changes in the load that the power harvester makes as part of its maximum power point tracking algorithm. So we're beginning to work on modified algorithms adapted specifically to accommodate how these microbes behave and hopefully allow us to have a higher efficiency when we're harvesting. And beyond power harvesting applications, MFCs also produce another interesting opportunity, fusing this power data with typical sensor data, which could allow us to infer more complex properties of the soil that we weren't able to sense before, such as nitrate content. So this is the potential to vastly improve our sensing arsenal, but in a low cost and environmentally sustainable way. Um, you know, in addition to those, I'm also hoping to investigate a couple other adjacent topics. So one thing worth mentioning uh, is how do we make this system low enough, low enough cost for developing nations? So farmers in developing nations, they don't have a lot of money to invest in sensor networks. So if it's expensive for a U.S. farmer, imagine how unattainable it is for developing nations. And uh, to top it all off, most of these farmers don't even have computers or wired internet connections. However, most of them do have a smartphone. Uh, eventually, I want to work on attaching this radar to a smartphone or maybe even use smartphones with radars built in like some of the Google Pixel models to enable smallholder farmers to make soil moisture measurements by hand. And you know, this is important because these small farms are prevalent in developing nations. And furthermore, these farms actually have higher than average water usage. So remember I said 70% of our fresh water went to agriculture. In developing nations with these smallholder farms, it can exceed 80% sometimes. So if we want to truly solve this problem globally, we need to have solutions in mind that are accessible to these smallholder farmers. And that there's other areas ripe for exploration. So for example, imagine if we could use RF to sense if fruit on trees or in the grocery stores ready to eat, or maybe um, going out of the farm and more into kind of our everyday lives, could we build a detector that informs us if an unattended drink has been tampered with when we're at a bar or a party? And as you might imagine, the technique of using a modulating backscatter tag is useful beyond sensing soil moisture. The tag is very helpful for uh, being able to detect it underground, but the same approach uh, of modulation is helpful in any environment where clutter presents a problem, such as homes and offices. So here we have uh, measurements showing how a modulating target compared to a non-modulating target leads to significant gain. And some of the potential future applications besides soil moisture could include locating lost objects, monitoring vital uh, signs of multiple patients simultaneously. So I just put up a quick proof of concept for that one, or potentially even tagging infrastructure for autonomous vehicles or robots. Um, so, you know, I kind of envision a future where we can use backscatter tags to make smart wallpaper, um, or, you know, just kind of imagine what is going to be possible when we have ultra wideband radios integrated with access points. So now the access points will be able to range clients and each other. Um, Imagine having sensor systems so ubiquitous and affordable that we can get highly accurate provenance tracking for everything that we produce. So, you know, for a smartphone, for, for example, what were the emissions of the factories that produced each chip? How much carbon did it take the chip uh, to ship those chips to where they need to be assembled? 
Uh, measuring the scale of sustainability related problems is a cru crucial step to the eventual solutions to sustainability issues. And you know, th those are just some of a few of the interesting topics in this area. So with that, I want to thank you for giving me this time to speak today. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that I happen to be hiring PhD students and postdocs. So if you or somebody you know are interested in these types of problems, or even if you just want to chat, uh, please do send an email. I have my address on this slide. And if you have any questions, I am happy to take a few now. Thank you so much, Colin. That was, a, that was really an amazing talk. I loved it. Uh, there seems to be quite a few questions. Um, so let's uh, go over uh, each of these questions. I also have a couple of questions I'll ask after. Um, so the first question is, how does the RF propagation changes with respect to different frequency bands, like 900 megahertz versus uh, 5 gig, or even higher frequencies in the soil versus, I guess, in the environment, I guess, like in the air or vacuum? Yeah, uh, I actually have a slide for that. Let me stop sharing. So it's kind of as you expect. Um, the more, the higher in frequency you go, the, the more attenuation you're going to see. And I think mm -hmm. I, I hid that slide instead of putting it in the um, extra slides for some reason. Here we go. Share screen. So uh, yeah, so this is showing exactly that, you know, what, what happens if you change the center frequency. So our radar is around, centered around two gigahertz. Um, so, you know, you, you want the radar to be as low frequency as possible. Um, but there, there's a lot of design trade-offs because the, the higher, the, the lower the frequency, the bigger your antennas need to be. So we, we found that this radar that we have is kind of a good sweet spot where everything's still mobile and portable, but it performs to the depths that you want it to perform for agricultural sensing. I think I have, um, and that just went straight to it. But yeah, like th there's um, ground penetrating radars, for example, they have really good penetration um, characteristics, uh, but they're like between 200 and 600 megahertz. And some of these are like the size of a lawnmower. So you're not going to be flying around with that. So, you know, kind of the real goal of my work was to try and find something that uh, it can work handheld and for you know smaller farms, but at the same time, it's possible potentially to scale it to larger farms. So we really want something that can be uh, compatible with this trend that we're seeing for farm robots and farm, you know, a lot of farmers actually do aerial imaging. So can we leverage those trends to make sensing more of a reality? I see. That's that's great. Um, so let's see. Let's next. Let's go to next question. Um, regarding the FFT, how are you sure that there is no second peak with magnitude value close to the first one? Sorry, I can now uh, move the chat. With magnitude, uh, well, that that has that's a choice of the um, frequency that you choose. So you want to make sure that you're not choosing, uh, if I'm understanding the question correctly, kind of the question is how, how can you be sure that the oscillation is the tag and not something else? And I guess one thing to remember is the primary application of this is being in the middle of a farm field. So you're not gonna have things like 60 Hertz um, AC kind of causing confusion. So uh, if you're seeing something oscillating and you have ahead of time knowledge of what the oscillation frequency is, uh, you can be pretty sure that it's the tag. Uh, Staros, this, uh, uh, yes, yes, but, uh, it's okay. It's okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Awesome. Cool. Um, so I guess, yeah, I have a question regarding uh, the durability of the sensor. So, um, so these are being deployed in the soil, right? Like, like do you think their durability changes because of the soil as opposed to, you know, in the air? Like uh, how, how long do they last? Uh, yep. So yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, putting anything outdoors is going to be uh, a challenge for durability. And you know, that, that's one of actually the biggest challenges with sensor network sensor networks. I think it's actually slightly better underground because they mm -hmm. are basically insulated. The, the sensing is more difficult, but um, 
you know, assuming that the waterproofing is up to spec, then you're not going to be, uh, you know, you're less likely to be disturbed, to have things ripped out, and uh, so on and so forth. It, you know, to actually evaluate it, we obviously kind of want to fabricate these and put them out for a few years. We're not, we're not at that point yet. Um, but I think being able to leave them underground uh, is a pretty big advantage. I guess. Oh, okay, I see. So if, assuming they're moisture proof, um, the hardware is going to be, you know, sustainable because it's not being disturbed. Okay, I see. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and the sustainability question is a really good one. And we started thinking about, uh, you know, what it, what it means. Uh, so, for example, for those micro microbial fuel cells that I was mentioning near the end of the talk. Um, so this was our first prototype, right? So it's this big honk of PCB. Our second prototype actually involved, um, you know, these smaller containers. We actually lined them with burlap. And we cultivated the cells in the burlap. And then when installing the cells, we took the burlap out and put that into the ground. And mm. the, the electrodes of the um, fuel cell are typically inert, so carbon. So you're putting biodegradable, uh, so it's like titanium, carbon felt, and burlap, plus the, the harvesting chip. So the least sustainable part of that is going to be the chip. And th that's a very open problem. You know, I think there's growing interest in, you know, can we design PCBs to have more environmentally friendly fabrics? One of the questions I was thinking about is like, maybe we could in the future design these sensors uh, to have some sort of expiration date. So maybe you know, kind of, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the fact that like the forks that are compostable, they actually need, you can't compost those at home. You need an external enzyme. So maybe we could have like a, a self kill packet of enzyme fluid where the microcontroller keeps track of how many years it's been. And after the sensor has been deployed for 15 years, or like if it hasn't been interrogated in five years, then it like starts self-destructing and becoming part of the earth. So that's a kind of like a, a dream shot, moonshot dream. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sustainability is, I guess, yeah, it's a very important problem here. Uh, yeah. It's, it's nice. Yeah. This is, uh, this is kind of amazing, actually. I've never seen this kind of work, um, harvesting power from the micro, microbial fuel cells, I guess. like Yeah, it's a really exciting area. This will help in, in, in that line of work, I guess, right? Um, so I guess um, the another question um, is, are these uh, used only for sensing so far, or uh, do you also want to use for communication? Like you, like when you collect the data, right? You also want to send to like a nearby gateway or something. So it's yeah. yeah. So um, I can see like you know, like I mentioned earlier, the microbes they actually have this very interesting behavior. So right now they're only used for sensing, but uh, down the line, I think I have a picture of kind of the vision right here. It would be awesome to power the tag using the microbes. And then the tag, you can use it to sense soil moisture. And then um, some related works, uh, we haven't you know, proved it yet by kind of recreating it, but we're pretty sure that we can use similar approaches to measure electrical conductivity and temperature. So those are two other very valuable measurements for farming. So basically with this sensing system, then you enable backscatter and you'll be able to collect this. Right now we have wired hardware and kind of a dedicated chip just for the observation purposes. But you know, someday in the future, it will be awesome to have this capacity to do this measurement and collecting that measurement all just with the, this, the um, microbial fuel cell and the backscatter tag. And that, so kind of this self-contained sensing system. So thank you so much, Colleen, for giving us this talk. Uh, lots of insights. Thanks a lot. Yeah, you're very welcome.